God is showing everyone who he is. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembrick. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. As we go through the Bible in one year, we learn something today in the scripture that's important as we study Exodus chapter 10. This is a good one. Corey? I'm actually going to be taking a look at Exodus chapter 8, specifically the plague of gnats. Ryan, how about you? Well, guys, you know, some claim that the Bible's plagued with contradictions. Uh, for one thing, some claim that the fifth and seventh plagues of Egypt contradict each other. We're going to see if that's true or not a little bit later on. Very good. Look forward to that. What did you do, Jen? It must be a plague kind of day. My segment's called plagues. <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, this is a good time to study the scripture. Get your Bible out. Turn to chapter 10 of the book of Exodus. It's a, a great book. And let's study what God is doing here because God is speaking to us. Let's listen to what he says. Exodus chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. Now the Lord said to Moses, Go in to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine before him, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son the mighty things I have done in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron came into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. Or else, if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory, and they shall cover the face of the earth so that no one will be able to see the earth and they shall eat the residue of what is left, which remains to you from the hail, and they shall eat every tree which grows up for you out of the field. They shall fill your houses, the houses of all your servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither your fathers nor your father's fathers have seen since the day that they were on the earth to this day. And he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh's servants said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet know that Egypt is destroyed? So Moses and Aaron were brought again to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go, serve the Lord your God. Who are the ones that are going? And Moses said, we will go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds we will go, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. Then he said to them, The Lord had better be with you when I let you and your little ones go. Beware, for evil is ahead of you. Not so. Go now, you who are men, and serve the Lord, for that is what you desired. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, all that the hail has left. Exodus chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. You know, I remember talking to someone when I was pastoring, it was great, and he was a negotiator. You know, he was somebody who specialized in negotiation. And he always said, you know, I, I negotiate. Somebody says something to me and I negotiate with them. But you know, let me ask you a question. When God gives a command, why won't we listen? Why won't he listen to our negotiations? Now, when God lays out his will, sometimes we try to figure out how we can still get what we want. But what if we give God just a little bit less than what he wants, like we're negotiating? God does not take second best. So when we fail to respond appropriately to his word, there are consequences. Now, does this make God judgmental or domineering? 
That's what we often hurl back at someone who refuses to negotiate in a way that makes us happy. But remember that God's care is for us. God is not against us. You see, God is not giving commands because he needs something from us, but rather because he knows how we need to change our own betterment. Really, God has purposes for us and we won't be truly well or whole until we follow him to fulfill those purposes. God also knows our weaknesses. In the case of Exodus, God did not change his demands of Pharaoh because he had not created Israel to be slaves, nor any man for that matter. In the book of Genesis, it says, have dominion over the animals, but not over each other. Very interesting. Now, as we begin to think this through and understand it, we see a difference between human nature and the nature of God. Human nature is very, very bad, and the nature of God is excellent and perfect. Many times we don't see that nature because we're trying to judge his Bible in human nature, and we can't do that. Get your Bible guide, turn to today's passage because it's excellent, reading Exodus chapter 10. And if you don't have a guide, we'll send you one. If you want one, we'll be happy to send it to you. It's all new material this year. And uh, you can also go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. BibleDiscoveryTV.com is a great place. Click on it. It'll take you to a donate page. Thank you for your donations. Also, just want to mention that we have a prayer meeting three times a week, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 3.30. So uh, make sure you join us for the prayer meeting. That's very, very important. 3.30 to 4.30, uh, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays will be there. Now, Father, I pray today that as we look at the locusts and the eighth plague, that we see that, you know, we don't start making excuses. Well, how come God made Pharaoh's heart strong and all that business? But we listen to what you said because we understand, Lord, that, that Pharaoh's heart was a heart that saw himself as God. Help us to put that in the mix and help us to understand Pharaoh, how he thought. In the name of Jesus Christ, teach us your way and show us your paths. And we said together, amen. Now, look at this read. This is Exodus chapter 10, verse 1. It says, now the Lord said to Moses. There it is again. The Lord said to Moses. God uses that term often in the Bible. The Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servant, that I may show these signs of mine before him. God is showing his signs. You know, Pharaoh had 10 reasons to let Israel go. He said no to every one of them. Verse two, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's sons the mighty things that I have done in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them that you may know. This is very important. God says, my signs which I have done among them that you may know that I am the Lord. That's very important. Now, remember, God is showing who God is to everyone. That's what he's doing. He's showing himself to Israel. And the Lord is speaking to the people through his actions. Now, let me ask you a question. Everybody says to me, why does the Lord just show up on CNN? Why does the Lord just show up on Fox News? Just show up on ABC, CBS, NBC. Just show up on CTV and CBC and the rest of it. God has done so much for us. Showed up in his own son, Jesus Christ, in which the Holy Spirit fathered fully God and fully man. We refuse to believe it, but I believe it. What about you? who lived a perfect life and he was sentenced to death. We sentenced him to death and he allowed it on the cross. As a result of that, he was killed. And by the third day, he rose up from the dead and came alive in the flesh again and showed himself to over 500 men before he ascended to heaven. And he said, if you believe in me, then I will give you eternal life. You see, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what God did. 
Let's go back to what else God said in verse 10, chapter three. So Moses and Aaron came into Pharaoh and said to him, thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourselves before me? Let my people go that they may serve me or else if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts in your territory and they shall cover you face or cover the face of the earth so that no one will be able to see the earth and they shall eat the residue of what's left, which remains to you from the hail, and they shall eat every tree which grows up for you out of the field. They shall fill your houses and the houses of all your servants and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither you nor your fathers nor your father's fathers have seen since the day that they were on the earth to this day. And he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Listen carefully. This is very important. The Lord threatened Egypt because Pharaoh was acting as God. Our hearts must always be humble and obedient to the Lord, beloved. Now, since we're here, let's go on to the next scripture. Exodus chapter 10, 7 says, then Pharaoh's servants said to him, how long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not know that Egypt is destroyed? So Moses and Aaron were brought again to Pharaoh. And he said to them, go serve the Lord your God. Who are the ones who will go with you? And Moses said, we will go with our young and our old and with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds, we will go for we must hold a feast to the Lord. Then he said to them, well, the Lord had better be with you when I let you go and your little ones go. Beware, for evil is ahead of you. Not so. Go now, you who are men, and serve the Lord, for that is what you desired. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. And then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, and all the hail has left. You see, God negotiates God does not negotiate. His command is his command. The Lord knows the future and is able to help us. Listen to me carefully, beloved. God knows our future. God is able to help us. Something's happening here. And as we look at Egypt, they are, have no choice. God has brought them to the place where soon things will change. Well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study. And today I'm focused on Exodus chapter 9. And we're right in the midst of the 10 plagues of Egypt. And you know, some claim that there's a contradiction between the 5th and 7th plagues. Now, if you recall, the 5th plague is the death of the Egyptian livestock. And the 7th plague is hail. Now, this claim that the Bible is contradicting itself here is a very, very old one. But in truth, it's a very flimsy argument. And this segment should help to set the record straight. <laughs> Exodus chapter 7 through 12 document the 10 plagues which God brought upon the Pharaoh and his people for refusing to let his people go. In chapter 9, however, there seems to be an inconsistency. That's because in the fifth plague, God brings disease upon the Egyptians' cattle, and verse 6 records that all the livestock of Egypt died. However, just a few verses later in the seventh plague of hail, God warns Pharaoh to gather your livestock and all you have in the field. For the hail shall come down on every man and every animal which is found in the field and not brought home, and they shall die. So if all the livestock of Egypt died in the fifth plague, then how can God be warning Pharaoh to bring his livestock in from the field for the seventh plague? Actually, the alleged inconsistency arises not because of any biblical shortcomings, but rather from a failure to read the text carefully. In the fifth plague, all the livestock of Egypt that were in the field died, says Exodus 9.3, this is what the all refers to in verse 6, all that were in the field in the land of Egypt. Those that were not in the field presumably survived, 
and are seen again in the seventh plague, along with any new livestock that may have been acquired in the intervening time. Indeed, the Bible does not tell us how much time transpired between the fifth and seventh plagues, and so it's possible that in addition to the livestock which remained alive, more were acquired either from the Israelites in the land of Goshen, or from surrounding territories such as Libya, Ethiopia, and Canaan. So any livestock not in the field during the fifth and seventh plagues would have survived, though the firstborn of them would later die in the tenth plague. Where is any inconsistency? You know, a lot of these so-called Bible contradictions are really a product of our own ignorance. You know, it's like today's example. It's a result of us simply not reading the text carefully. So the error isn't on the Bible's part, but it's on our part. And as you'll see as we examine a lot of the supposed contradictions and errors throughout the year, there really are none. The Bible claims to be God's word, and it absolutely lives up to that claim. I think it's important to remember that if it claims to be God's word, then it is the words of God or the words of the Holy Spirit. I think mm -hmm. that's important. Absolutely. That's how we teach it. Okay, Corey, what's up? Well, I'm going to be focusing in on Exodus chapter 8, and this chapter describes a few of the different plagues of Egypt, but I want to focus specifically in on the plague of gnats that we read about beginning in verse 16. Uh, and, you know, it's almost impossible, it is impossible really, to uh, know from the Hebrew word here for gnat exactly what kind, kind of biting insect is in view. Uh, but a lot of scholars think that because it is a biting insect, it's probably some form of lice. So today, you and I are going to be taking a look at lice in the archaeological record. There is a surprising amount of them. Take a look. The day-to-day -day lives of humans differ sometimes drastically depending on the environment in which they live, the governments or power structures running their countries, and their wealth. While these differences today are made even greater by technology or its absence, it's also technology that has allowed us to see problems that have always plagued humanity regardless of status or time. One such problem is head lice, the common parasite that takes up uncomfortable residence on the human body. Both literary and physical remains have shown historians the severity of the problem. Ancient Egyptian records contain medical remedies for helping rid the body of lice, and the works of Greek historian Herodotus inform us that Egyptian scribes and priests kept their entire bodies shaved close to altogether avoid the pests. Lice even show up in the Jewish tradition of the Babylonian Talmud, with rules on how to handle lice on the Sabbath. Later in Christian history, a certain strain of pious men saw an ultimate sign of humility in the lowly louse. Julian the Apostate in the 300s AD is said to have proudly kept a visible infestation. The literary evidence for lice being a common issue is backed up by physical remains. In Egypt, desiccated bodies of lice and their eggs have been found still clinging to the hair of mummies. And in Israel, wooden combs from the Dead Sea community of Qumran were found to still be harboring the insect's ancient remains. These two-sided combs tend to be more decorated than the combs we modern humans would pick up from the drugstore, but their teeth and function is nearly identical. The teeth that are wider apart are used first to detangle the hair and get that first sweep of larger insects out. The side with the closer together teeth is then used to slowly, methodically trap any remaining insects and sweep away what you hope is all of the sticky lice eggs. The wooden material of these ancient combs likely helped in this endeavor, providing a bit more friction than their modern, generally plastic counterparts. The efficacy of these simple hand tools is displayed by the amount of lice remains still found on their tongs nearly two millennia after their burial, and by the fact that modern versions are still used in lice treatment. Now, one of the interesting parts about this plague of gnats is it's the first plague that was not uh, able to be replicated by the um, magicians of Pharaoh. And this is the first plague that they said and attributed to the hand or the finger of God they pointed to a divine origin for it um, and it would be then the very next plague the plague of flies that it specifically mentioned that uh, that one didn't go into the land of Goshen where the Israelites were so the plagues begin to change here with the plague of gnats uh, first with the recognition that there is something otherworldly going on it's not just you know Moses and Aaron manipulating the spiritual system there is some sort of divine hand at play here that's actually recognized uh, 
uh, in the plague of gnats. You know, that's interesting, the, the plague of gnats. You know, it's just kind of mm -hmm. like, Ooh. Or lice or whatever <laughs> oh. you want to say. Some English translations do translate this to be lice, so that may, may be what yours says. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's so. uh, incredible. And you know, it's true, I, you know, parasitical things and mm -hmm. things that are parasites that live on us. Uh, yeah. You know, that's true. I don't want to get into this. No, you're it's making it itchy, scratchy. <laughs> Start to get itchy, scratchy. Yeah, it's a common yeah. problem yeah. even today. It's, it's mm -hmm. you know, uh -huh. something that all humans have to deal with at some point or other. Yeah. I think the Egyptians had it right. You know, just shave your hair off. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. see the guys with yeah. the slick heads? Man, that's yeah. the way to go right Absolutely. there. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, well, Janice, what'd you do? That's kind of hard to segue into, isn't it? <laughs> it is, I know, it I'm sorry. Bit hard, but I'll tell you something. I have never been in a plague of locusts, and I hope that I never am, but I did grow up in Sudbury, born and raised there, Northern Ontario, and about every seven years, we did get a plague of something that we called tent caterpillars. And it literally looked like the trees were covered in tents, almost like a, like a spider web look. And then the eggs of these tent caterpillars were laid inside and then as the eggs hatched you could see if you looked up close you could see the little caterpillars moving on the inside and then when they broke open they would come down like little ninjas they would come <laughs> down on on this little web and I can remember going to school when I was in grade seven and it was quite a good walk and I had to walk under trees and they were so bad when I was in grade seven that year that I had to take an umbrella and they couldn't take my bike because the roads were so slippery oh, from wow. the caterpillars. And what would happen too is that they would go up into the trees before mm. they came down and they would strip the trees of all of their leaves. And this is how they sustain their life. And so we would literally watch our trees disappear, all of the green leaves, and it was a real plague. And I thought, so as I'm reading this about the locust, God is, is warning Pharaoh and, he, and, and God asked Pharaoh, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? It's a good question. Pharaoh should have done it then. He was already, this was the eighth plague. And God fulfilled every plague that he said he was going to do. And in fact, you know, Pharaoh's men tried to convince him as well. Mm -hmm. Don't you know that Egypt has been destroyed? But I wanted to point out today, you know, sometimes maybe your life feels like it's a burden. Maybe things feel like, maybe you feel like you've been robbed or that, or that things have just been eaten away, taken away from you like the locusts had done here or like those tent caterpillars would just climb up into a beautiful live tree and eat everything off of it. Maybe you're that in that place in your life where you feel like nothing is going well everything is being eaten up and it's almost like you don't have any control well I want to introduce you if you don't already know the Lord Jesus Christ he can come into your life and he can fulfill and restore the things that the locusts have eaten up in your life God has good things for you God is for you and not against you God wants you to follow him not to walk alone but to follow him, to know his word, to spend time with him in prayer, to get to know him, not as a drill sergeant, but as a heavenly father, someone who loves you, someone who wants you to live well with him, someone who has given his only son to pay the cost of our sin by giving himself and dying on the cross. But that's not where it ended. That paid for our sin. The shedding of his blood cleansed us from our sin. It took our sins from crimson red and made them as white as snow. We couldn't do that. Only Jesus could. But then three days later, he rose from the dead and that was to give us the gift of eternal life that's what we have through Jesus so if you're feeling today like you just feel like giving up that nothing is going your way that nothing is right that everything that you seem to touch goes wrong you need to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and if you do if you have been weary in doing well brother or sister you need to know that God loves you God sees you and God hears you. He has not left you alone. Spend time in prayer. Praise him. Praise him because the atmosphere around you will change as you praise the Lord Jesus. Do that today. It might feel mechanical at first. It might feel strange. It might not sound very nice if you sing a song, but it doesn't matter. God doesn't hear the sound. 
coming from your mouth. He hears what's in your heart. So do that today. Be encouraged. And your family here, all of us here at Bible Discovery are praying for you. We are standing with you as your brother and your sister. Don't let the enemy whisper things in your ear. Listen to the voice of God who loves you and encourages you today. I think it's important for us to pray right now that there are people who are discouraged because of things that have happened. Mm -hmm. So Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. First of all, we thank you. We, we enter your courts with praise and we come into your, your thank, gates for thanksgiving and we thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done. But Father, we have gone through it uh, this last year and we continue to go through it. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to turn our lives to you. Help us to turn our lives to you. We're gonna come back to you, Lord. We're gonna praise your name because your Psalms tells us to do that. So Lord, help us, help us, help us. We need to feel your presence. Holy Spirit, come into our hearts and come into our lives and be with every single person who's watching this program. The, the people who are saved, they're saved from the ravages of hell. The people who are not saved, bring them to you, Lord, because it's time for us to get right with God. And I pray in Jesus' name that we would do so right now and today. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask this, and we all said together, amen and amen. As we conclude the program today, let's pray and ask the Lord to, to do something for us. Here's what we need to ask. Lord, my free will can get in the way of serving you. Help me to follow you and help me to do so with all my heart, with all my mind, and with all my strength. Because Lord, that's the only way to serve Jesus Christ. In your name we pray and we said together, Amen.